subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates sridhar hi uh, welcome to the equity master investor hour uh, it's it's a delight to have you been trying to get you for some time i know my mail landed in spam and you reached out and so thank you for that but thanks for inviting me great so uh, uh, as always in the uh, in the investor art we like to start right from the beginning so tell us a little bit about yourself in the sense where you grew up how was the environment in your home were there ipo firms investment firms were your parents investors take us through the early part of your life yeah so actually my father had a transferable job so even though i am from uh, kerala uh, i have hardly stayed there i studied uh, in lucknow for about 7 uh, 8 years and then most part of my education was in calcutta uh, and uh, that's where i finished my college my ca cs icwa and uh, my first uh, uh, you know introduction to stock market was when i did my industrial training with as the greenlist bank uh in their investment bank uh, as part of my ca training uh and i guess that was the first time i got introduced uh our office was so close to the calcutta stock exchange and we used to regularly file for uh you know ipos this is back in 91 92 uh and uh, so that was my first introduction uh going to the you know ring and calcutta stock exchange uh initially they had no clue what people were screaming about but uh, over a period uh, i guess it all started to make sense uh, and plus when you're doing your ca you you understand about finance and accounting and what this is all about so i would say that is my you know very early uh, introduction to stock market not from any stock market background family father had never invested uh, so that's that's how i would put it that uh, i was lucky to uh you know be part of uh, the investment bank in grill is which introduced me to the markets yeah. so uh, you mentioned your father was in a transferable job was he in a government uh, job or and no he was with the sarabai group he was uh, okay. in their accounts uh, so he was transferred to multiple parts of their uh, organizations i heard the word accounts and i note that you also did the ca <laughs> very much very much in the family okay and uh, anz grindleys i remember those days was it had a pretty significant uh, presence in india is my understanding correct that's right so uh, i completed my ca i did about one and a half years of industrial training there uh, but then uh, i got my first job uh, with city bank in 92 uh, and i uh, moved on to mumbai uh, then uh, and it so happened that uh, uh, you know uh, Uh, one and a half years in city bank in the corporate bank somehow i wasn't feeling uh, to be in the right place and i was looking for opportunities to get back to the stock markets in some form or the other uh, so that's when morgan stanley happened uh, so this was in 94 uh, when morgan stanley hired it was just four or five people in the in the team i joined immediately after the ipo so there was quite a quite a bit of chaos in the office almost every day but uh, as somebody uh, with just few people in the organization you were doing multitasking so it was a great experience initially to do multiple parts of organization yeah, I, I, when you say ipo you refer to the morgan stanley growth fund the famous famous yes 1980 1994 Thank january you. was the ipo i joined some sometime in march april yeah. so we'll come to that i just want to step back a moment and go back to calcutta so yeah. why do you were at anz you were uh, they were doing ipos and you were going to the stock exchange and filling in the forms and all those days everything was manual fill in sure, the form sure yes yeah did. yeah and calcutta was even then wasn't uh, now i with all uh, you know uh, disclaimers wasn't it like the den of most of the big traders in india it was uh, so i as i said my baptism to the stock markets uh, was uh, in the big bad world <laughs> uh so uh, there were so many scams going on in calcutta but then you you also uh, had a chance to learn uh, and working in grinlays we would hardly do many of we would not do many of the transactions because of a lot of the compliance issues that they had uh, but i had quite good bosses who explained to me why we would do and why would we wouldn't so it was a learning process uh, but i did make a lot of friends in calcutta which helped me in later part of the years uh, When, when I was in Morgan Stanley, when the whole Harsha Mehta thing broke up, 
Uh, anyone who has studied it knows that a whole chunk of it was happening out of Calcutta, I would assume, right? Very much, very much. Do you remember any of the uh, IPOs uh, uh, that you you know carried the forms, filled filled in the forms, and submitted to the exchange? Do you remember most of the yeah, most of the uh, uh, companies are non-existent now. Actually, unfortunately, I remember there was a company called HDC which was in. Uh, in steels, uh, but uh, that company doesn't exist, uh, or maybe it got merged or something happened. Uh, but most of the companies, uh, actually, uh, from whatever I remember, uh, I did not make it uh, for enough for another five ten years. Uh, so because there were IPO booms that were happening in those days, so any Tom, Dick, and Harry would come to the market. Uh, so uh, I don't remember any successful ones who who made it at that time. Uh, yeah, that's that's my faint remembrance. There is something to be said about IPO booms uh, coinciding with stock market booms and those companies not lasting for long, right? Yes, it's very well. Again, there's a lesson in there for people who are focused only on IPOs, I guess. So uh, you were there, then you, of course, moved to Morgan Stanley in 1994. This is when their big Morgan Stanley growth fund issue had closed or were you part of the issue process? Uh, no, I joined after the issue closed. Uh, so it, strangely enough, uh, they needed a company secretary. Uh, so uh, I actually joined them because I had the secretarial uh, qualification. And they also were looking for somebody who had a CA background uh, to uh, do some bit of financial control. As I said, I, I did multiple tasks in Morgan Stanley. And those days, markets were open only for two hours, between 12 and 2. Uh, so I used to trade. Uh, for the funds between 12 and 2. And then between the trading, I would uh, take care of the secretarial and the financial control part of the job uh, and to some extent taxation. So it was like crazy. I mean, I had like uh, mul multiple hats. Multiple hats, more than multiple hats. So, uh, you know, uh, in many of our investor hour sessions, We've come across uh, money managers and all with illustrious track records like yourself who started their careers in the early 90s, right? And one talking point time and again becomes the Morgan Stanley Growth Fund. Now, in with the hindsight of, you know, nearly 30 years, what was that episode like? Because, you know, we've all heard of queues stretching up to the Churchgate station from the stock exchange, which is probably a kilometer and a half. It's uh, we've uh, you know heard about people paying a premium to buy a mutual fund unit. Yeah, yeah. And of course, then you know I think it went through a mixed performance. Ultimately, I did think I I do vaguely recollect it became an open ended fund and it did well. But take us through that whole experience and tell us a little bit about what you know what happened later. Uh, yeah. So actually, it was uh, I would say sort of missold. It was a mutual fund, and for the first time, you had a MNC who had started a asset management company in India and was launching a close-ended fund. And those days, close-ended funds were common. Uh, actually, more close-ended funds were there uh, at that time than open-ended fund. If you remember, all the master shares and master gains of UTI were all close-ended funds. Uh, I think the problem was most because this also coincided with the IPO boom. So most people bought it assuming that this is an IPO and not a mutual fund. And the other thing was that uh, there was a green shoe option uh, to uh, collect. The issue size was 300 and it could have, uh, it was uh, up to about 900 crores in, in those years. So actually almost everybody who wanted actually got their shares. Uh, but actually in terms of performance, the first year actually was a very good performance. In terms of performance, the performance was very good. Credit to Vinod Sethi, Akash Prakash, who were the you know portfolio managers at that point of time. Uh, but uh, in mutual fund, you don't uh, you don't look at absolute performance. You look at relative performance to the benchmark, and the fund actually did very well in the first year. But unfortunately, the NAV was below ten, and the market price was trading possibly twenty thirty percent below the NAV. So I guess that because it resulted was on the exchange. Because there was exactly. The NAV on the yeah, exactly. So that resulted in in all the bad press and. The whole, uh, you know, the noise about poor performance. Uh, but, uh, you know, standalone, if you just look at performance of the mutual fund, I mean, it did have issues with performance also uh, later on. But I would say the first year actually had a good performance. Uh, so that's that's where I would I would leave it. 
uh, and uh, then it was uh, you know over a period others came in and launched mutual funds they were open ended and there was more criticism uh, because this had a tenure of 15 years and stuff like that yeah but uh, just to uh, one more point on uh, morgan stanley growth fund if you look back at the portfolio you guys built out there in 1994 uh, uh, what comes to your mind like uh, was it like a good solid portfolio because after 94 even the market's crashed right one can yeah. always so i i think there were too many regulatory issues also at that point of time so you had to get as per the sebi regulations you had to get uh about 85% if i remember correctly invested within the first 6 months uh and also what also happened was morgan stanley at that time launched a number of international funds uh so we had 900 crores of funds from morgan stanley growth fund i think we had about 2500 or 3000 crores of money from fii investments which also had to get invested uh i mean relatively these numbers look very small in today's context but in those days these were fairly fairly substantial and i remember i was on the trading desk and my job was if you get any block just close it so that's it it didn't matter what the stock was because we were in a hurry to get invested uh because we would have reached the guideline so that 85% now is 65% right now or okay right so yeah so that that would have uh, got adjusted but i guess that that was the challenge that in the first year i think the fund ended up with almost 300 stocks and then over a period this was rationalized and uh, you know the portfolio was brought to some sort of uh, manageable levels uh, i would say over the years but that was the challenge and also as you said that september 94 was the peak of the market and uh, then uh, i think we saw any in the index very close to that only sometime in 2000 so you're talking of Uh, you know my starting in the markets was actually through a 6 7 year bear market uh, wow. so which is why it is very difficult for me to get bullish <laughs> you've been primed for a bear market huh always looking for the downside so that tends to work out well in the long term actually for many uh, so you you uh, you were trading over there but tell us at, at what point did you get around to making your first personal investment and tell us a little bit about the if you can share the name of the stock the, the little bit of the story behind it uh, actually my personal investments i would say uh, given that the fund was fairly large uh, and i think for the first 4 5 years we were not allowed to invest in the market at all as part of the compliance and then uh, we got some relaxation and we were allowed to invest and we had to hold it for a year uh and by the time all this happened i think it was 98 99 when we got some sort of a clearance and i ended up buying rubbish tech stocks uh and they all double tripled i don't even remember the name but i would say i just got lucky because i wanted to buy a house uh and uh, just to buy a house i needed some capital uh, i ended up selling most of the tech stocks which uh, within 5 months fell 99% many of them i don't think are listed so i think uh i think it was more a luck than anything else so i wouldn't say anything about my initial investments thanks to my uh, you know uh, uh, buying a house resulted in me exiting some of those stocks actually people who have lived through 99 2000 will realize that we haven't yet seen a bull market of that stature where you know stocks will go up uh, circuit to circuit for maybe 4 5 months uh and those were really crazy days uh but uh having lived through that uh i guess uh, those were my initial uh investments and i would say very lucky had nothing to do with any skill at all but over that period i was understanding how to analyze balance sheets and i've seen from very close quarters the fund manager struggling because even good companies with good results were not resulting in any reward as far as market price is concerned because we are going through very tough bear markets even within asia you had the asian crisis at that point of time so the macro environment wasn't that great for equities at that point of time which is when i understood about you know how macro is important uh, so a lot of learnings happened during those uh, bear phases phases i would say yeah. so uh, you say macros are important but a lot of the gurus and starting with mr buffett would say you don't worry a lot about the macros because it's so difficult to predict 
But uh, I think from experience, you've seen that macros can play a big role uh, on, you know. Yeah, so I guess there are different styles uh, people have, uh, at least from the school that I have come through. Uh, you know, we've always played a lot of importance on macro. And I've typically seen that if macros are conducive, uh, then, uh, you know, you can end up with disproportionate returns. And as I've seen very closely that between 94 and 99, actually between 94 and 2003, actually, if I remove those TMT stocks, which went up and came down, the market didn't do anything for nine years. Uh, and it was really painful period for some of the fund managers. And fortunately, I wasn't managing. I was uh, started off as a trader, then as an analyst. So I was still learning the ropes, uh, tricks and uh, and you how to get out at the peak? You you were you were the lucky guy. That that was that was a, that was a, that was totally luck. <laughs> totally luck, but uh, what kind? What luck, right? Really. So uh, so that you got away with. Let's say let's take you at your word. You got away with it, right? Let's say no skill, luck. But do you recollect uh, making an investment which actually went bad? And talk to us about that, the story and the learnings. Uh, yeah, I think in two thousand. Uh, you know, I would say 2008, I think, when the market started to correct, uh, you know, you didn't know the extent or scale of the correction that that is going to happen. Uh, and at, in those phases, uh, you know, definitely I had made, uh, you know, some mistakes for, for the personal portfolio also and even for the fund. Uh, and I guess you learn because that was again such a big macro shock that we have not we had never seen anything in that scale, uh, and no amount of bottom fishing worked at that time. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess uh, those were learnings that uh, you know sometimes you have to just respect the macro and you know stay away, be on the sideline, and so and see how things play out. Two thousand and eight long, or you uh, sold at the bottom. Uh, what, what really happened? So I would say entering into 2007, uh, we were quite cautious. Uh, actually, we hardly participated in, you know, any of the, uh, you know, IPOs at that point of time. Uh, we didn't participate in, uh, in the real estate uh, bubble that was happening at that time. Uh, but still, there were always you know, some stock or the other, because the carnage was so huge and it, it, it actually uh, almost encompassed the almost, uh, I would say 90, 95% of the market, uh, that there was no place to hide. Uh, and, you know, in some of the mid caps and small caps, I would say uh, the ones where you had to take a bigger hit uh, than the normal. I would say 2008, actually we outperformed, but 2009 was the difficult year because 2009, the market uh, rebounded very sharply, uh, and we had we were still holding a defensive portfolio, and uh, we underperformed in two thousand nine. But that helped us later. So in in hindsight, uh, it played out well over a period of time. And and do you attribute the playing out uh, well to just uh, like buying and holding quality stocks, or having pivoted at the right time? So I would say that. Uh, a bit of both. Uh, so I remember sometime in 2000, I would say September or October of 2009, where I made a presentation to my that time boss, Richard Sharma, that, uh, uh, and he was the head of emerging markets. And emerging markets, because it's a large portfolio, you cannot have so many stocks. So you would normally have, okay, 10 stocks from India and things like that. And I had made a presentation showing how the staples, which are the FMCG stocks, the premium to the market was at the lowest in, in the last 20 years at that time. Uh, and this was quite an anti-consensus call at that point of time because people were running back or rushing back into the cyclicals and the high beta stocks. And here I was making a presentation of buying staples. And, and uh, to buy staples uh, in the size that we needed, I'm talking of, say, $100, $200 million for the emerging market funds, maybe similar size for the domestic funds. Uh, it was a fairly substantial, uh, you know, purchase and the liquidity was not supportive. So we had to buy a basket. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's when I made the presentation that you just buy a basket of, you know, everything, Asian paints to Godrej to HUL, ITC and, uh, you know, whatever you can uh, buy in that Colgate 
uh, and uh, one of the reasons at that time also was the government was also stimulating the economy uh, through fiscal stimulus and uh, the call was that uh, this will result in more consumption so it did play out very well because uh, not only did the companies get earnings growth i think they had their best decadal uh, yeah. rating after that uh, i mean i can remember that asian paints at that time was in the teens in terms of uh, the p uh, colgate and uh, uh, all the others nestle they were all in the 18 to 20 band uh, in terms of the p uh, and this at that time it was the lowest that it had seen yeah. so it it just played out very well uh, but it was uh, uh, there was no instant gratification because uh, you carried through some underperformance for 6 months and it's only after that uh, you saw the fruits so i guess that's the yeah that's a great call because i remember that uh, i think uh, hul hindustan unilever those days hindustan lever probably had gone through a 10 year period with uh, with point to point no change no change in price yes <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and many of the other staples also i i guess what also happened was many of the large holders were getting frustrated and that's how we got blocks uh, i have to thank some of the securities broking guys who helped me you know get some blocks because i'd left open mandates that uh, any staples fmcg company don't even come to me just close the block wow so <laughs> it did work out in this conversation one thing i find very interesting you're referring to buying blocks because as a individual if you want to take exposure to fmcg in 2009 it's quite easy right you could just go out and buy there's enough liquidity but when you are buying you have to buy a minimum amount uh, yeah so actually one very early i realized that position sizing in your portfolio is very important like if i buy a put a stock in my portfolio and it is 25 or 50 basis points if it doubles it it ba- basically adds 50 basis points to my performance which is often a rounding off error when you're managing large uh, you know portfolios you have to ensure that your position size if you have conviction is good uh, and that i learned very early uh, and which is why i said blocks because these stocks you could never buy on the screen uh, the impact cost would have been so high that uh, it would have been detrimental to our own objective of trying to build a portfolio uh, but being patient we did manage to buy significant amounts of uh, you know blocks uh, getting uh, you know other other funds to sell uh, that's how you, i mean that's how most funds actually in those days were uh, because the liquidity in um, barring the top 20 i would say liquidity in, in many of the other stocks were not that great So position sizing is one of our favorite topics, and we are going to come to that a little later. But sure. I just want to. So we've spoken about the Harshad Mehta period. You, you know, you sidestepped it. You got lucky in the TMT. You've spoken to us about the learnings in the Great Financial Crash, or crisis, whatever it's called. Talk to us about the pandemic. With all this learning behind you, uh, how did you? Uh, okay, first talk. Tell us about when did you sort of realize something's going wrong. did you take any action and how did march april 2020 play out for you so our view was very clear that uh, we'll follow the us markets uh, and we are happy to miss the first 10% because this is something that's happening for the first time uh, and we have no clue no view of way of analyzing it so we did raise cash in march uh, we were slightly ahead i would say not very ahead but early march we started to get some sense that there's something uh, bad which could happen uh, especially because uh, there were uh, people from uh, uk who were doing calls uh, especially from the welcome trust who were involved with pandemic and very closely involved with who i happened to be in one of those calls obviously a lot of their predictions were wrong because uh, their predictions were very scary but having said that uh, we also got scared looking at what they were projecting and we did raise cash sometime in march and uh, our view was very clear a lot of them looked very attractive at, as the prices were falling but uh, as a house we kept a discipline that we happy to miss the first 10% but follow the us markets uh, because we have no idea of how this will play out uh, and is that the yeah, markets yeah. would know the us markets would get the first hint yeah, of whether yeah. it can be tackled yeah. or not yeah so the other thing we did was value over growth at that point of time because one we didn't know what we were entering into 
so uh, our view was that uh, let's look at value over growth which is where i have earnings cushion uh, where i have price to book cushion uh, and build a portfolio based on that it's not that you always zero invested right your 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 whatever cash you've created your you're trying to deploy that or you're trying to reposition your portfolio so i think during the pandemic i would say that's how uh, things played out that uh, i would say mid april may is when we were looking to seriously invest but uh, the idea was value over growth i mean commodities were the very obvious ones i mean they were trading at point to book at that time so they were uh, and as a house our house is very strong with their uh, projections on commodity uh, and even during 2003 in morgan stanley we had taken a fairly aggressive position on commodities uh, because they were at almost similar levels uh, in fact i remember i messaged my ex boss that uh, you know commodities are uh, you know almost at the same price to book as it was in 2003 uh, so Yeah. I think whenever I think of the pandemic, and uh, in hindsight, you know, it it appears to be a smart call to have gone all in in March, but the fact is, a lot of the people were running blind, and it could have gone either way. So when That's you right. say you were looking at the U.S. market, it's pretty counterintuitive. But I'm I'm uh, the way I'm reading it is that you are basically looking for a signal that the market has figured out that. it's going to get worse or it's going to get better yeah this that's the mother of all markets so yeah. there was no point me yeah. 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 and there no point me betting uh, against uh, the mother of all markets so it was easier to take the call that let's take cues from the us market and allow the first 10% to go through because you could have false starts so i would say i mean uh, to be honest all of us were blind that's so, right and if you remember i think mangal spoke sometime in march and he said the same thing he says uh, we'd like to come out with more cash on the other side of this than less cash basically he was saying we're going to be very conservative but after that of course the situation changed there was news started trickling in i don't recollect exactly when the news came out about the vaccine uh, the that the was i think in november november i think october or november the oxford first, yeah. yeah oxford vaccine was the first uh, the yeah. news that filtered through uh, okay so uh, so okay so that's your Uh, you know the journey across the crisis <laughs> which overlaps perfectly with your career graph uh okay now let's move to the little bit uh, meat of this right uh let's talk about stock selection process now you already already given us a hint that you look at macros but uh let's leave the macro aside i'll come back to that later let's talk about stocks so how would you define your stock selection process I think it comes back to macro that if the macro is conducive, uh, then you would look at a bit more aggressive stock selection. Uh, which is, if your domestic macro is conducive, then you would first. I mean, that's how at least I have. Uh, I'm not really bottom up, bottom up, which is look at the stock from down and then try to fit it in a portfolio. Uh, because of the size of the portfolio that we were managing, uh, and the fact that. Uh, in my earlier part of the career and anybody who's managing a benchmark portfolio you're slaves to the benchmark so you are trying to fit things in and around uh, the benchmark and then take the deviation for the alpha that uh, you would generate so that's how i would uh, say that depending on macro so i would give you an example of say 2013 and 14 uh, which were actually very good years uh, for our fund in morgan stanley because in 2013 the macro was looking very bad and we had a very defensive portfolio uh and uh, as things turned out during 2013 you know india went into the fragile five we had inflation issues uh and then we had you know uh, rate tightening from raghuram rajan and that also was very aggressive as we were heading into 2014 i would say november december uh at least my call was and we had difference of opinion within our office uh, itself in morgan stanley uh but the fund that i managed uh, i took a position that these uh macro call um, uh, the changes that have happened to rates and inflation inflation would significantly come off over the uh, period of next 6 months and we didn't have any idea what will happen to the election and my view was whatever happens to the election the macro is going to look far better 
and we couldn't have had worse coalition governments than what we've had in the previous two. So it can only look better from here. Uh, so there was no reason to hide in IT and pharma. It was time to get into domestic cyclicals. So it was time to look at domestic stocks. Uh, so it was just a large call. And once you do that, then you just buy, you know, the top five, six names that you can in each of those sectors in the domestic cyclicals. So you're really not trying to, uh, you know, do very much bottom up, but you do bottom up only to the extent that, okay, I need to buy, say, uh, you know, 20% in financials, or I need to up my position say, by 20% in financials, then what would I buy? Obviously, some of the existing stocks, but that wouldn't add up for the size that we managed. So then you would add up a few more. PSU Bank, you would, which you would normally not own, uh, that was the easiest uh, to buy because if that's the call. So that's how I would say that stock selection and macro, they're so linked. Uh, if you're managing a size portfolio, if you're managing a small portfolio, it's fine. I can, you know, bottom fish, I can go to the, you know, small cap, mid cap, and, you know, find some jewels there. I don't think I have the skills to do that because I've never done it. Yeah. But uh, uh, I like uh, the way you mentioned it, that uh, even if it's a coalition government, it couldn't be worse than what we've already had. So the bear in you had protected your underside. You you knew that the downside can't be worse than what we've Actually, seen. Actually, we, we have a group of fund managers who meet very regularly uh, in Mumbai. Almost, uh, I would say, 15 of us, and we meet for lunch and we exchange ideas. And we had a bet uh, sometime in August. And one of the you know uh, famous fund manager, I won't name him, uh, he had said that BJP will get 150 uh, for the 2014, and I was at 200 plus. And uh, the bet was that the next uh, lunch he would sponsor. After the uh, yeah, obviously the number was far higher. Also, I end up doing a lot of road trips. Uh, so uh, I travel a lot uh, to the interiors. Uh, may also because I'm into wildlife, so I'll, I go to the jungle. So most of the time you are in deep, deep part of the you know, interior part of the uh, country. And on the way, I normally stop down at, uh, you know, at some chai stop or you know, have some samosa and chat with people there. And I think I got a broad sense that we are in for a surprise. Uh, surely not to the extent that we got uh, from the elections, but I was uh, reasonably sure to expect that uh, we would get a better coalition than what it was. So that gave me more confidence in terms of positioning. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, position size matters a lot. I think in 2014, our fund had a, you know, I think 20% alpha. So the fund outperformed the benchmark by 20%. So, which is which never happens actually. This is so so, so outlined, yeah. But uh, and possibly the best performance uh, I had in my in my career. But that the was also of, paid off. <laughs> All the chai and the chai stalls paid off. Huh? It paid off a lot. Yeah, yeah. It paid off a lot. So I would say it does help. So I, I'm sure some of the credit goes to your Xbox, Mr. Ruchir Sharma, who's been traveling the country every before every election. And we had a difference with him, by the way. Yeah. But, he, he was in not that trip. Mm. No, it is only sometime in April that he actually started to believe what I started to say, because oh. unfortunately, he also travels with people uh, who have a certain ideology uh, yeah. and are, do are, no are not wanting to see the other side. Whereas you. You know, yeah, whereas you have to have an open mind uh, when you're meeting people. So I guess, uh, but in sometime in April, he did realize that uh, what I was saying Look is what happen. could happen. Yes. Interesting. Uh, talking about macros again. So the I, uh, I like the idea of the, the way you uh, talk about it and the way you follow it is that the macro is a tailwind. If the tailwind is in your favor, all you have to do is get the broad stocks right as against picking up the perfect stock that is going to beat all adversity and come out on top. So I would guess both the strategies, like you have said at the beginning of that, you know, there are multiple approaches, but uh, the macro approach, I, I think, uh, has a resonance to it. But to understand the macro is tough, right? I think you, uh, when you speak, you can easily get, you've got a global perspective. I ask you about the pandemic, you say, you know, you're looking at the U.S. market. That's not the first answer that comes to, you know, most of us and most of the listeners. So uh, this strategy, of course, has worked well for you. You've been following it for 20 years or 20 plus years. Uh, 
could you maybe give us a little more color to it, little more examples, a little more downside, what people who are watching and listening can keep in mind when they try and start thinking from a top-down perspective, which is macro first? Some, some yeah, so, yeah, so I think, uh, it, I think it also comes from the fact that I was part of Emerging Markets team. As you know, my ex-boss, Richard Sharma, was very a, a macro person. Uh, our team itself was very macro oriented. So I would give credit to the entire Morgan Stanley macro team to have inbuilt uh, some sort of a discipline in terms of looking at the macro. Because in India, uh, I don't think too many people look at macro the way we do. Uh, so I think it is something that has to come over a period of time because generally it is believed that you just look at the stock and, and then you then you buy. I'm not disputing that. So what we used to do is get the macro right and then look at the stock and, and then see if it uh, fits into the overall uh, strategy. Yeah, there are exceptions where you meet an exceptional company and you, you think, okay, this is too good to be true or uh, this is so good, doesn't matter what the macro says, you build a portfolio and, and stay, uh, stay with that uh, over a period of time. But I would say that... Uh, these are really small data points, no? I mean, you look at what's happening to inflation uh, domestically, look at what's happening to inflation in the US or UK, try and project how it could move. Uh, over the years, I've built my own inflation model for India. It's not very difficult because it's an index. And you know how this index has moved over the last 10 years. You have all the data. So like for this year, I can say that the inflation, my own model is not working because the inflation is much higher. Uh, than what uh, I would have projected. And my gut feel is that RBI will miss the fourth quarter guidance that they have given. Uh, they have, I think, projected 5.8% average inflation for Q4 of this uh, financial year. I don't see how that uh, you know happens. I'll be happy if that happens and I'm wrong because that's good for the market. Uh, but uh, just giving you a data point because when you track these inflation numbers so closely, you know where it can go and how things can go wrong. Uh, so I think uh, there is no right or wrong answer. You have to track a lot of data points when you're saying macro and you need to track them on a regular basis. And macro, of course, if you're looking top down, you're looking at the country level, right? Yes. Direction yes. is headed, how is inflation and all yeah. that. Then you're also looking sectoral, the mega trends and the mega themes. Yeah, so that's that's how I would, uh, you know, phrase macro as... Uh, uh, as a starting point for me, and then, uh, you know, fit in the uh, puzzles, the missing links uh, in terms of buying the stocks uh, after and, that. Yeah. And I was also asking you about the mega trends, like, uh, you know, uh, you, you've got the economy, right? Then you're trying to get the industry, right? Perhaps. Yeah, that's right. So I would say like mega trends, one of the mega trends that uh, we looked at sometime in 20, as I mentioned, value over growth, because uh, growth was being priced in for, uh, you know, as if they're going to continue for infinity. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember sometime, same time, sometime in two years back, which is 2020, we were, uh, somebody had requested that we take a, a, you know, meeting, a Zoom meeting with a PSU chairman. And I said, I'm not going to invest in a PSU bank. What is the point? So he said, at least you'll get some sense of what's happening. And I told my uh, my partner is that, okay, let's take the call because government is doing a lot of credit guarantee schemes. At least we'll get a sense of what's happening because these banks were lending a lot to MSMEs and stuff like that. And as the meeting progressed, we realized that his uh, pre-provision profit uh, was higher than his market cap. And I said, <laughs> oh my God, this is, has to be crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, so then we checked. Uh, obviously, we, we took a substantial position. The company also did a QIP. Uh, stock is up three times from where we actually met. Uh, and we did then check all the other PSUs uh, to check what is happening. Uh, we were always, already in the value versus growth, but somewhere you miss a lot of these uh, because you feel these are non-investable. Uh, but I guess uh, they, have re they have reached such lows that it was very difficult to lose from there. Uh, so I guess uh, the mega trend was already there. It was just a question of repositioning uh, and looking at some of the ideas which you had missed. Uh, and uh, those sort of trends have stayed out. We're still in that value versus growth, preferring value. But uh, I would say at the margin, we are now 
uh, tilting or looking at growth because growth stocks have really corrected a lot. Uh, I mean, 50, 60, some of the new age technology stocks, 70, 80%. So we are starting to you know look at the business models, see if some of them make sense, uh, but our tilt is still towards value. So uh, what I'm taking away is that you think macro, your, your, but your eyes and ears are always open. Hey, suddenly you come across a stock, you know, which is whose profits are more than the market cap. You, you know, you jump at it. So you're always like uh, looking around. You mentioned, uh, you know, high tech stock, uh, uh, the, the tech stocks, and uh, obviously what comes to mind are really the U.S. stocks because they are the real yeah. tech stock which have all, all, all collapsed. But also, and- also in India, I mean, a lot of the new age tech stocks got listed last year and. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, the valuation just didn't make sense at that time, at least to us. Uh, and one of the points I've always highlighted is I've lived through 2000, where we gave 50 times revenue multiple to Infosys and Wipro. Uh, they were not bad companies. They were actually great companies, but it's just that we were giving them a wrong value. And it took seven, eight years for those prices to come back. In fact, if you look back at Z Telefilm, it's still not reached its 2000 high. And we're talking of 22 years. So, and it's it's still a good company. So I think it's a question is, what is the price you're paying for a good company? Uh, and at least it didn't make sense for us last year. Now, some of it is, uh, you know, making sense. We're trying to understand what's happening there. What is the business model? Uh, and then we'll take it forward from there. If things work out, then we may invest. Great. Okay, so for the viewers, think macro, think be flexible. Don't, don't get uh, compartmentalized. Uh, portfolio construction. So this is where we talk sizing, but uh, uh, I'm going to request you either to think like an uh, individual investor. You know, your our typical viewer listener is an individual. Uh, talk about portfolio construction. Talk about position sizing. This is the moment where uh, we think that uh, you know we need to delve deeper into this topic. Uh, see, actually, as an individual, you want to diversify. Uh, and uh, because your job is not uh, to invest in stock market, you have your own some other job and uh, you are just investing because either you have a passion for investing or uh, you want to create wealth for yourself. Uh, so the portfolio sizing has to be very different from how it will be for a mutual fund. I would say that for a fund, uh, you know, the top, top 10 stocks possibly uh, have to be uh, about at least around 35 to 40% uh, of your portfolio uh, because then only it will give you the, uh, uh, you know, the position sizes, right? Because the top stock, top three, four stocks will be much higher weight. The 10th stock will be much lower weight. Uh, whereas for an individual, it has to be a bit more diversified because I'm not sure if, he has the ability to track bad news, which comes. And sometimes the corrections can be so vicious that he may lose a lot of the gains. I mean, my best advice to most people is that, you know, you're better off with a mutual fund uh, as an individual, because a lot of these issues are taken care of because the mutual fund, fund manager is doing this. And I'm not very sure if many individual portfolios have really outperformed. I'm sure there are, but I would say on an average, it's only the kick that you get. Uh, I'm not very sure if over, say, five years, 10 years, they've really outperformed the benchmark. If somebody has, then he's done a great job. But I would say on an average, most people wouldn't have outperformed. So what is the point apart from getting a figure better off with a mutual fund? I mean, that would be my broad advice. Yeah, yeah. but given that, uh, you know, a lot of our viewers are very stock focused and hopefully they've done well. Uh, typically, how many stocks in a portfolio do you think an individual can handle? I mean, surely not more than 30, 40, I would 30, 40, say. 40, I mean, I think yeah. so, yeah. The smaller that, the better that, because you've got all the things in your life going on. Yeah. Uh, professional so, funds these days have 30, 40 stocks. So, and they have teams of people tracking those companies. Uh, yeah, but individuals, what happens is you actually don't position size. You end up, you know, buying a lot of these IPOs or somebody gives a tip. You buy some uh, stock, it goes up. Then you don't know whether you should buy or you should sell. Uh, I would say somewhere in that range, 30, 40, not more than that, uh, should be the ideal position size. So we had uh, 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 Vijay Kedia on the uh, investor recently, and he spoke about uh, betting big. 
So if you find the right stock, he believed that you have to bet big. I think something like what you're saying that, you know, top 10 has to be 35, 40%, but the top one or two stocks, you have to put more money in it. Yes. Uh, so I guess that's that's where it comes to sizing. So if you find a great stock and allocate 1% to it, and even if it doubles or triples. Yeah, it doesn't add up. Yeah, it so it has to be more than 5%. So often what happens as a fund, I can say that uh, normally we would say that if I'm very bullish, it has to be 300 basis points over the benchmark. That should be my starting. Uh, and then if you're more bullish, then you take as, as, more, as you get more convinced, more data, then you take it higher. If, if you're 100 basis points over the benchmark, again, the same thing comes because I'm used to a benchmark criteria. That's why I'm, I'm coming back uh, to the benchmark. Managers, but if, you know. Yeah, but if you don't have a benchmark, then somewhere in that 3 to 4% should be of your portfolio should be the minimum size. And if you're very bullish, then you take it up to seven, eight percent. Yeah. And uh, uh, have you figured out, so, you know, no matter how much conviction you have in a stock, you could go wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you're taking a big bet, big bet is a big loss if, if, if yes. you get it wrong. Have you figured out like a framework to prevent you from uh, blowing up your portfolio just because you bet big on a stock? Is it like a red uh, line? Uh, that, no, that I think I yeah I think the red line is the uh, is the management quality and the amount of research that you do on a company. Even then, you can go wrong, but your probability of going wrong goes down. Uh, so if you go wrong, even after that, it is mostly because some policy has changed, uh, which has nothing to do with with the company. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, which which is not uh, something or something like the pandemic happened and you know all the portfolio. Uh, you know, they blow up, something like that. But uh, generally, I would say if you do your homework right, your uh, management tick marks, your balance sheet tick marks, uh, you're okay. Uh, you would, and I think one of the criteria we had is that if you can avoid accidents, uh, then you tend to outperform, which is you, you don't want a stock down 50% in your portfolio. If you can avoid that, even if you're not, uh, you know, getting all the upsides. In a, the other thing is you can't win all battles, right? So you, you know, fight only those battles which you understand. So, I mean, FOMO is the serious problem. So I, oh, as a yeah. portfolio manager, I, I would say that I've avoided having FOMO. I've missed many, uh, you know, uh, rallies, uh, like the real estate rally in 2007. We didn't participate in DLA, we didn't buy Unitech or any of the others. And I remember my boss was from Delhi and he was very unhappy because every time he went to a party in Delhi, he would he would be told, hey, you guys didn't participate in DLFC, 500 has gone to 1000. And then in nine months, it was uh, in two digits. Uh, but you know how bosses are. They don't remember what they said. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so... Let's say you know you got this portfolio and you got you stock you selected high conviction stocks, done your portfolio sizing and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. When do you actually when and how do you decide to sell a stock? I guess yeah, this is so the other yeah. part of individual portfolios where people either hold on for too long or they sell too fast. So yeah, so I think it's the selling is always a tough uh, you know trade to have. Uh, I would say what happens is that when you find that the opportunity in some other stock is far better, uh, at least from a fund construct, that was far easier because you were working with a, a limited pool of money and you're normally, I would say, 95% invested. Uh, so you find some other stock which is far more uh, convincing or if some of the parameters that you had set uh, for the stock have reached and even after you know, reviewing some of the change metrics, you still find that uh, these look interesting, but it's a very uh, fluid uh, answer that I'm giving because it changes from time to time and there is no right answer for this. If you ask any fund manager, this is the most difficult part. When do you book profits? You know, <laughs> there's no right. right answer to it. You're right, because uh, the other thing is the whole emotional angle that comes into this, right? You are wedded to the stock and how do you tell yourself especially if the stock's gone the other way that you were wrong, right? The whole psychology thing kicks in. So I like what you said. You can actually set out a predefined sell criteria that, you know, 
if this doesn't happen, you have to exit. So, you know, you're not kicking yourself. You say, I always planned it. But what, what if the stock's doing very well? Let's say you bought DLF in 2006 and you're riding it all the way up. And if you don't have a defined criteria, then that's, that's like horrible, right? Yeah. So, uh, so actually the IPO came mid 2007 uh, and uh, within six months, it was double. Uh, so, and then you had the financial crisis and, you know, everything went for a toss. I mean, I can tell you why we didn't buy something like a DLF or any of the other, uh, you know, real estate companies, uh, Reliance Power. I mean, those were the famous IPOs, which everybody participated and we stayed away and we got a flag for many of them, uh, that you didn't participate, but in hindsight, it worked out. And I think it was a very simple philosophy that. Many of these companies were discounting their profits for 10 years of land bank or 12 years of land bank. And as I said, uh, we were part of the emerging market scheme and I've seen how similar Chinese companies were being valued. Not more than three years of land bank, anybody was giving you know any multiple at all. Whereas we were happily giving multiples for 10 years land bank and 15 years land bank. Just didn't make sense for us. And when we did back calculation of number of households sold, and if you were to you know, sell, make buildings for all the land and how many households. It wasn't adding up from a micro or from a macro standpoint. Uh, same for Alliance Power, that it was a dream. Uh, you had nothing uh, on the table. And I remember one of the investment bankers after my meeting gave me a spreadsheet uh, saying that, uh, Sridhar, this is a spreadsheet, the IRR. You put money for the entire IPO, then only you'll get allocation. And once you do that, your IRR is some... 30% or something in one 15 days or 20 days. And I was thinking wow. money making can't be so easy, right? That, uh, so obviously simple, that, but, not easy. No? <laughs> but that spreadsheet I still have. Uh, and I told the investment banker who's a good friend that the day I write a book, that spreadsheet goes <laughs> into the book <laughs> because that ensured that I should not invest. I was very clear as I was heading into my car and I looked at the spreadsheet. I said, okay, if I had any doubt after seeing the spreadsheet, I know, now, though, I surely should not put money in this. Yeah, yeah. But when you uh, when you talk of selling, I really, uh, I think logically the right thing to do is if you get a better stock, you should switch, right? Because if the market's down, you're selling cheap, you're buying cheap. If the market's high, you're selling high and buying high. So, but it's just the whole psychological thing of getting over it that becomes a little more uh, makes the whole situation a little more challenging. I think. Uh, that's right. Moving on from uh, portfolios and stocks, looking a little bigger, how what do you think and how do you think about asset allocation for yourself? Uh, different asset classes, uh, your thoughts on that and how do you go about planning that? Yeah, so actually, uh, I'm quite a bull on gold. Uh, and, you know, I have constant arguments with a lot of my fund managers uh, who think gold is rubbish. Uh, and uh, when you look at gold performance, and actually one of the points which they miss is that gold is actually a hedge of hedge for the currency. Indian rupee. So yes. for say, so look at current, uh, gold performance for the current year. It's up ten percent. It's beating the uh, Nifty by say three four percent. And you look at gold performance for say five years or say fifteen years or twenty years, uh, you would find that gold is roughly in line with. Nifty, maybe 100, 200 basis points here and there. 15 years, it outperforms the Nifty. 20 years, it's maybe 100 basis points less than, less than the Nifty. Uh, and I often say that I salute the Indian women. They are the best fund managers in the country because by just buying gold, they've outperformed all the benchmarks for over a long period of time and even on the short period of time. And they didn't have to look at balance sheet. They didn't have to, you know, look at some, you know, P ratio, some crisis happening, COVID crisis, that crisis. Yeah. They've outperformed over a period of time. And uh, I have constant arguments. I'm sorry, uh, sorry. the problems of. So, uh, as I said, that I have constant arguments with some of my, uh, you know, fund manager friends on uh, on this. But. And the other thing is that the government has a great scheme as far as gold is concerned. The sovereign gold bond, if you see, you get 2.5% extra on that. Uh, plus, it is tax-free at the end of seven years. If you add the 2.5%, gold beats uh, Nifty by a big margin. Right. So, yeah. so I, I, I think 
So I have 10% uh, allocated to gold. Uh, that's because I'm also in the equity markets. Uh, so I understand equity. So I think there are better opportunities than equity. Uh, but it's for somebody who isn't, for somebody who isn't, he should have a higher uh, allocation to gold uh, because uh, you it's it's an asset class that uh, you know has beaten inflation over a long period of time, and the government scheme is very good as long as the government is giving you this scheme uh, where you get two and a half percent interest or every year plus it's tax free at the end of seven years. Uh, I mean, at least you should start with five or ten percent and eventually take it higher. Yep. So. Uh... You know, uh, as long as you're in India, which is capital hungry, we'll always be importing capital. We've got a weaker currency in the long term. So that's your hedge. And probably I think 3 to 5% depreciation of the rupee over a long period of time is baked in. So by buying gold, you're hedging against that. But I just want to thank you for making that point that even though you're in equity, you should consider some allocation to gold because it can do well. You know, a lot of the times I come across uh, notes and uh, publications which, where people proudly say they're 100% in equity. And I think that may be good for them and that's fine. But I think it it's maybe not the best message for the readers. Because yeah, and uh, even for them, my problem is that I've always seen that they try to put down gold by uh, sending the dollar returns of gold. And I said, this is so unfair. You're comparing apples and oranges. And I've had Arguments on WhatsApp, some of them have got angry with me. And I said, the, 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 you know, that lady from Kolapur has beaten you hands down, boss. You're feeling bad because of that. <laughs> she had all the free time in any case. She didn't have to run around like you're meeting companies. Huh? <laughs> yeah, so I said it's an asset allocation. So each, each person has to do their own asset allocation. But the data is so strong that you'll be foolish to ignore it. That's all I can say. I mean, the rest, rest of it is your call. I mean, you want to invest your money the way you want uh, what about real estate, property, real estate? Yeah, uh, yeah so real estate, I, I haven't invested in real estate apart from the house that I'm staying uh, because it's a bit illiquid and my understanding of the market isn't so good. Uh, so I prefer to have, uh, you know, things which are more liquid. Uh, obviously, some part of the money is in tax-free bonds and debt, maybe 15, 20% you keep uh, in debt. So it's not like I'm 100% or 90% invested in equity. That's not how it is. So I, I have a, reasonable asset allocation, but real estate hasn't formed part. I don't understand that uh, market so well, but I'm sure there are a lot of others who understand this better and have invested well in that. Yeah, that's that's another great learning, right? You should do what you understand and what you don't probably give money to. Unfortunately, there are no real estate funds in India. There are REITs, which are very different from, you know, yeah. buying and selling real estate. That's, uh, that's different. Uh, any other thoughts on asset allocation? Any other learnings, experiences you've had over time? Uh, no, I think uh, some part you can invest overseas if you want. Uh, but I think India's opportunity is so good. I wouldn't force people to you know, invest overseas or in these overseas uh, uh, funds. Uh, but it's always good to uh, you know, diversify into other parts. Uh, especially, as I said, that uh, because those are invested in a different currency, you also get the depreciation of the uh, uh, currency benefit in it. So uh, I think those are various ways of investing. But I think we have so much opportunity within India that you don't need to do all that. Uh, I mean, I think between uh, gold and possibly equity and uh, some debt, uh, you can easily juggle and, uh, you know, make a good portfolio. Yep. Great. Uh, that's great advice. Uh, moving to the last set of questions. So uh, you have kids? I do uh, have. Age, ages, roughly? This. So my son is 24 and my daughter is 20. Okay, so now the most difficult question. How are you teaching them about money and investing? <laughs> so my son is not in, interested in uh, in finance. So he's like a, he's more interested in gaming. He's a gamer. So he's not interested. But my daughter is doing her CA. That's where all the money is, by the way, in gaming. <laughs> She's so she will manage. She will manage the son's money. So my daughter is yeah. doing a CA, so she's interested in investing in stock yeah. markets. So, and so I guess it is kept alive. Huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kept alive. But I, I, a lot of people I talk to, teaching children is very difficult. Is about money, especially your own children, right? Uh, for whatever reason. But so I believe that it should come on their own. Uh, so no point. 
yeah. yeah. So no point forcing anything on them. So uh, I mean, I I didn't know that my daughter will do CA. It just happened that one day she said, uh, "Papa, I want to pursue CA." I said, "Wow." I mean, I was waiting for this day, but I'm happy that my son didn't say, but my daughter came and said this. We have a tradition of family which has uh, a lot of CAs. My grandfather was a chartered accountant, so oh, wow. so wow. I guess it helps. Wonderful. Now, India needs a lot of CAs, by the way, given the <laughs> amount of work uh, that the government has put on us. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so we were in a two-year pandemic. Uh, you know, your wife's probably saved up a lot of money. Not much shopping, not much eating out, and she comes to you and says, "Hey, Sridhar, I've saved up a crore of rupees. What should I do with that? What would be your advice to her?" No, oh, it'll be the same as as it was for the uh, stock of the uh, money that you she would have had, which is maybe fifty, sixty percent uh, should go depending on the age. I'm assuming she's not in the market. Uh, that around fifty, sixty percent should go. In uh, in equity in a mutual fund or uh, whatever, I I generally advise people that mutual fund is the best option. No point dabbling in stocks. But as you said, your viewers are people who understand stocks well, so they could you know look at stocks and uh, invest there. Uh, I so strongly advocate uh, gold. So I think that's something, specifically the uh, sovereign gold bond which the government issues, uh, and then maybe some debt options. There are very interesting debt options these days because interest rates are going up. You have uh good companies offering uh yields uh closer to 9 10% so These the REITs are yeah REITs yeah REITs also some of the REITs are offering uh you know yields which are very attractive so those are the other options you could you could look at and invest yeah by the way i think we have uh, uh embassy REITs uh, ceo because on the show next so we'll talk to him about the yields over there uh Okay, uh, so uh, what are your, you? You mentioned wildlife. We should ask you a little bit about wildlife. How did you get? Uh, how did you uh, pick that up? Uh, you know, as a uh, as a fund manager, uh, you are in a high stress job, uh, so you need to de stress and always had uh, you know some form of uh, uh, you know de stressing mechanism. I am actively involved with sports. uh and the other thing is to travel uh so uh i think it because of those issues i was a very outdoor person because of my sports and then traveling trekking that led to uh you know going to the jungles uh and then i picked up photography so then it the passion for photography comes in and uh that's that's how it built uh so i'm quite a passionate wildlife photographer Uh, I did see something on your Twitter profile. Did one of your pictures win an award or something? Yes, it did. Uh, quite a few awards actually. Uh, so Sanctuary Asia is one of the uh, premier uh, photography awards in India. Uh, so uh, my photograph did win uh, third prize last year. Uh, I got some international awards uh, uh, last year also, which were a wow. few of them were the top uh, awards. Well, uh, you, you spoke about multitasking at the beginning of the podcast. We should all remember that. <laughs> Don't lose sight no, of that. No, but as a fund manager, you need to de-stress because you, yeah. if you carry your portfolio, hard. yeah, if yeah. you carry your portfolio home, uh, then you tend to make more mistakes because it's not every day that your portfolio is doing well, and you tend to make more mistakes when your portfolio is not doing well. Uh, so I guess over a period, I realized that uh, so you know you need to, yeah, you need to de-stress. so that you're not making mistakes especially when you're underperforming your pressure to outperform is so much that you end up chasing what is performing well and that ends up doing the end up doing the wrong thing i'm giving you my gyan based on the mistakes that i've made so it is not that it came to me very normally so we all the, made mistakes that's the kind of gyan that works because it's real life right and yeah, so uh, we've learned like, from our mistakes and then you try to you know ensure that you don't make the same mistakes again uh what are your thoughts on giving away wealth yeah so i do a lot of that for the wildlife community uh so a lot of my charity goes into wildlife because uh, i'm very close to nature uh and the people who are protecting these wildlife are very poorly paid uh, especially the you know the guards the people inside the jungle who are trying to 
uh, you know, uh, save the poachers. Uh, man human uh, conflict in wildlife is so common because they're villagers next to the jungles. And uh, we spend a lot of money through some NGOs, uh, you know, educating them, helping them. Uh, and also we put solar uh, uh, water pumps inside the jungle because often the uh, tigers specifically, they come out in search of water. Uh, because in the summers, uh, these uh, water holes dry up. So uh, I think large part of my uh, giving goes into this. Some goes to some child education, but I would say very large part. Because a lot of people are already doing uh, the other part. Uh, the amount of uh, charity that is going into wildlife. I know a lot of people talk about nature and, you know, this is the in thing about environment, but I don't think enough goes to the people who require it. Uh, so that's where a lot, lot of my giving goes. Oh, it makes me feel so nice. And, you know, when you talk about the uh, the guards and all that, that's uh, that doesn't come up in any list, right? It doesn't come up. It doesn't come up. I, I, if I have to get corporate, yeah, if I have to get some corporate CSR to do this, it takes a lot of presentation to get anybody to agree to do any of this. Uh, it's not the easiest thing, especially say in winters. It's so cold, uh, and most of them, you know, are patrolling the jungle with not even you know proper gears, uh, and uh, and we are expecting them that they have to fight the poachers. It's not an easy task, but yeah, I think a lot of. Uh, uh, help these days is coming. People are uh, have understood about environment, wildlife protection. So, yeah, the fight is going on. More power to you. Yeah, have more you. success yeah. on that. Uh, okay, uh, switching uh, gears a bit again. Uh, you think macro. You know, macro is critical to you. And uh, let's talk a little bit of India. Let's talk for on India for a few minutes. India has had a couple of starts, right? Uh, 1991, 92 reforms were a big start. And uh, I know I mentioned this in one of the earlier podcasts and the guests, uh, you know, immediately said that, no, that's not the case, primarily because to a lot of us, we feel that India has had a lot of stop and starts. Point to point, it appears everything looks great. But I guess within a few years of the 91 reforms, we were all like, okay, now it's ended. Nothing else is happening. And then another burst of reform, another burst of reform. But this time, the kind of reforms we've seen, which have been a cumulative effect of the technology, the Aadhaar stack or whatever you call it, uh, people believe it's different and it's going to last. Uh, so talk to us about what you're thinking of India, its prospects. Are you in that camp that can be ahead of itself and this is the time to bet on India and why? Yeah, so I would go with, uh, you know, a statement which my, my boss often used in his books. Uh, that India disappoints the optimist and the pessimist. Uh, so if you're very optimistic on India, uh, you know, you will get disappointed. Uh, and if you are very pessimistic, also you'll get disappointed. Our reforms are incremental in nature. So would I say in the last six, seven years, we've had reforms? Yes, we've had. But I would say there are a lot of disappointments also. I think PSU divestment is one that we've been talking about uh, structural PSU divestment for almost five, six years now. Uh, and there are a lot of starts and stops. So I would say that there are the pace of reform has surely moved up in the last few years. Uh, and when you compare that with other emerging markets, because I, I track many of them very closely, India does stack up very well uh, in terms of the reforms that they have done. Could we have done more? Yeah, we could have. Uh, but I'm not going to nitpick. It's a democracy. It's a large democracy. Uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, that the governments face. So I think uh, I would say that uh, in the next few years, possibly we'll see much more in terms of reforms. Uh, and uh, I'm quite optimistic as far as India is concerned from a macro standpoint, specifically when I look at other markets. Uh, and you mentioned how India has done over a period of time. And and this is the statistics I often give that, you know, emerging markets over the last five years or 10 years, 15 years, they've not given any returns. I'm talking MSCI dollar returns. And in my past avatar, I've met many of the pension funds who actually put money in some of these emerging markets. Uh, and one of the basic pretexts was this is a higher risk uh, asset class, but this would end up giving me higher returns. But that hasn't been the case. And normally five years, 
most people are, you know, okay, they are okay if the asset class underperforms. 10 years is a serious question mark. 15 years is a, you know, red flag. Uh, I think this asset class is, will have serious questions. We're already seeing that where people are talking of, uh, you know, emerging market ex China and stuff like that. Uh, Russia has uh, gone out, South Africa, uh, uh, Turkey, nobody wants to invest. So I think a lot of question marks and clouds on this emerging market. So I've always highlighted that emerging market is not a homogeneous asset class. So you have countries which have current account surplus and countries which have current account deficit. You have countries which are you know, commodity exporting, you have countries which are commodity importing. You have per capita $20,000 country and a per capita $2,000 country, all mixed together. So the sum of parts is zero because the benefit of one negates with the, with the other. Uh, how long can this continue? Uh, so my point is that this asset class today or tomorrow will crumble. Eventually, people will start looking at subclasses within the asset, maybe uh, you know, South Asia and stuff like that, North Asia, uh, something of that sort. And India will stand out there. So even during this period where I said emerging markets haven't given any returns, India has roughly given 6 7% dollar returns over 15 years or 10 years. So it's done reasonably well at a time when emerging markets haven't done well. Uh, so that's why I said, in whichever way I look at uh, and cut and uh, slice uh, the whole pie, it looks very interesting. So I'm still quite bullish on India, actually. So India is, uh, would you say India is like where China was in the 90s, just taking off and like a 10, 20 year of massive build out of the economy, you know, manufacturing coming back? Because one of the issues with India has been, we skipped the manufacturing. And without yeah. manufacturing, there are no jobs, you know, semi-skilled jobs and all, they don't happen. And that's why you have unemployment. But now you think in this 10, 20, 30 year phase, we could get that right? Uh, but I would still be cautious that we should not look at China and say, okay, China did this. Can India do this? I think both countries are so different. I mean, uh, being a communist, not a democracy, they could do anything. And in those phases, they did very well. So if you see some of these statements that you see from Nirmala Sitaraman, she's actually unhappy that the corporate capex hasn't picked up despite she having reduced the tax to 25% almost three years back. Uh, so the, uh, you know, it's not so easy in India to expect that you do everything right and you get, you know, this corporate capex, it comes as if there's no tomorrow. The last time we saw something like that was in the 03, 07 period. Uh, and a large part was also driven by, you know, power sector reforms and uh, private sector coming into power. This time around, it's going to be manufacturing. The PLI is helping. So some of the schemes that the government has announced is helping. But uh, is is the ca capex mania really, you know, picked up? I would say companies are still cautious. Uh, they're announcing a lot of new capex, but uh, the execution on the ground, I would say, is still tepid. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I like what you preface this uh, uh, answer by uh, quoting your Xbox boss. India disappoints both the optimist and the pessimist. And I'm just wondering whether this should be the punchline of almost everything <laughs> because it's a good way to live your life, right? You'll be fine. You'll come yeah, out just exactly. Fine. Yeah, so actually, yeah, it, this is good for the markets also. Don't be extremely bullish, don't be extremely bearish. Uh, you'll get up in India, you always get opportunities to invest, as I said. Even in, in the worst period of, uh, you know, pandemic, uh, we found a bank which was having more profits than its market cap. So you will always find something. And it was a large cap. So it wow. wasn't even like... So, <laughs> the most so unexpected saying, thing came by, huh? Yeah, yeah. So you always find. So I, I think uh, I've learned over a period that no point being over bullish, no point being over bearish. You'll, you'll find your way uh, and uh, stay invested. Okay, wonderful. Moving on. Uh, talk to us about reading. How much do you time do you spend reading? Kind of stuff you read? Is there any global flavor in that? Just a little bit on that, please. So all my reading is work-related. Whatever I read, macro, research. I don't read any books. Uh, so if you ask me what is the last book you read, I haven't read any books at all. I actually watch a lot of movies uh you know so i speak five languages so i can actually i speak so i see movies in five languages so i'm reasonably updated with you know because i was in calcutta so i speak bengali i'm a south indian so i uh you know speak tamil and malayalam you to see all those big budget south indian movies in the original form 
Wow, yeah, lucky. I do. Yeah, I do. I, in fact, I saw all of them in the original form. Like Drishyam 2 is a Malayalam remake. I saw the Malayalam version, obviously. Oh. Uh, so, uh, so I spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, apart from that, whatever time I get, I spend outdoors, uh, which is either playing or uh, traveling. Uh, do, you so, think, uh, do you think knowing multiple languages helps you form better perspectives? Because your mind is just open to so many things that can exist beyond your most immediate? So often when you speak to people in their own language, they tend to open up far more. Oh. Uh, and that has been my experience that uh, given that I know so many languages, I tend to speak to people in language. Uh, and sometimes I don't, uh, sometimes it works if they don't know that I know the language. Uh-huh. And then you know so what they don't want. Icebreaker, huh? perfect icebreaker. <laughs> Yeah, so it does help. I mean, uh, I'm it, knowing multiple languages uh, is is surely a plus. Multitasking, plus. multiple languages, high bar for our viewers and listeners. Okay, uh, final question. Uh, not question. You know, any recommendations that you have for the viewers on how to become better wealth creators, not just stock pickers, better wealth creators. Uh. Disciplined asset allocation and staying invested for a long time. So it's it's a cliche. I mean, it's the time spent in the market which matters more than timing the market. So just spend as much time as possible. Uh, as I say, I normally tell people that just stay invested in a mutual fund because uh, individually it's very difficult for you to outperform if it's not your job. If that is your job, it's fine. But uh, and if you're investing in stocks and you're in a job, then invest in stocks, which has some relation to the job that you're doing. Because if there is a good news or a bad news, you will be the first to know. In other cases, you're the last to know. So you're holding the baby then till the end. So I would say those are the broad uh, you know, advice I can give. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, the simpler you keep, the better. Yeah. To that, on a lighter note, I'll add, make sure you multitask, learn multiple languages. Go out on your jungle jaunts and watch the original dr- Drishyam in Malayalam, you said? <laughs> in yes, Malayalam. Malayalam. Wonderful. On that note, Sridhar, wonderful, wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah, you. bye.